Welcome to Devil's Advocate. I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute. All right, I got to be honest. We are taping this about a week before it airs. So we've got a lot of predictions to have made of what happened, well, the day it airs. Will civil unions be the law? What will happen to the special session? Here are our predictions. But more importantly, what happened last week behind the scenes? To find out from Fox News, Eli Stokel, thanks for being here. Fox 31, Denver. Fox 31, <laughs> Denver. Branding important. From the Associated Press, <laughs> is that okay? Oh, can yeah. I just say AP? Yeah, you can say AP. dot Kristen Wyatt, thank you for being here. Thanks. All right. Uh, first of all, let, let's let's go. Let's rewind a week. Um, I haven't seen this much drama at the state capitol in a long time. This was this was a perfect bill to to get everybody. I mean, you either hated it or you loved it or you, it was it was fun to watch. Was it fun to report on? It was certainly interesting. I think most people have been down at the capitol a lot longer than I have. Said they've never seen anything like it. I mean, it was a huge meltdown. The speaker told me on Monday, the day before it all went down, if you see a mushroom cloud over the capitol, it'll be tomorrow it'll be Tuesday and it was a mushroom cloud because they blew up not just civil unions but everything else on the calendar it was so transparent there was so much attention and there's been so much backlash against Speaker McNulty and the House Republicans everybody said going into it they were in an untenable position they don't win if they pass the thing they don't win if they kill the thing they either let the Democrats be the heroes or they choose to be the villains but they lost in a bigger way with the public than I think anybody imagined. Well, you remember Caldera's political axiom, number one, there is nothing Republicans can't F up. But <laughs> let's take it away from the Republicans. The Democrats handled this masterfully. I mean, they were able to stall this bill to the last two weeks. They were able to work on a couple swing votes, and they put the Republicans in, in, this, in this situation that they couldn't win. Am I, am I wrong? No, I think Democrats insist that they were waiting to the last minute to help them Republicans that may have attracted a primary challenger. They say, we waited so long because Republicans were begging us, please, please wait till after nominating convention so I can be sure I don't have a primary challenger. Wait, wait, wait. So the Democrats were doing this to be nice they to the say, Republicans? They insist that they were they wanted well, to work they, together. you you got to believe that. So they did that yes. because they wanted to be Worked nice to their potential yes. opponents and they didn't want them to have a tight, tight primaries. And then the other side of that were Republicans stringing them along, delay, delay, delay this, we'll come on board after our primary, or after our nominating conventions, and then they didn't do it, hoping they would just be able to, at that point, run off the clock. In, in any case, it definitely seemed to fall into the Democrats, uh, look, look like it went all their way. They had had it planned from the very beginning. Pat Stedman, the Senate sponsor of the bill, insists that when he introduced it, like the, in January, was got a lot of pushback from Republicans saying, why did you drop this so soon? Give us some more time. Make sure we don't attract a primary challenger. Then we'll come on board. So I think there's a lot of finger pointing, but I think that's understandable at, a, at an emotional well, issue. Well, like pardon that. me for being skeptical about this, but Democrats had four years that they could have passed this any time that, that, that they wanted to, and they didn't. They had the opportunity uh, this year to put it on the ballot. And if public opinion is what everyone says it is, three-fourths of Colorado is, is fine with civil unions, then it would have been a no-brainer if you put it on the ballot. They didn't do that. They waited, they waited until two weeks before. They dropped it. They put the Republicans in this tight political s squeeze. I'm thinking, I'm thinking now, and, and you've heard this before, I'm wondering if Democrats honestly want this to pass. Because as long as they have it, they've got a unifying theme, they've got something that's popular, and they've got something that keeps their coalition very, very strong. Not every homosexual wants higher taxes, more debt, more spending, and government education. There are a lot of libertarian-leaning homosexuals. I want them. I want them to come out. Well, I don't want them that way, although I might be interested. We'll talk. I want them to come out and work for small free market ideas. So is this, is this part of, of the grand democratic strategy, which is, hey, let's, this is a winning issue. The longer it takes for us to win, the greater the victory. Well, that may be true. And you can certainly criticize Democrats for, or at least ask, why didn't you bring this up when you controlled the, both chambers? And you know maybe it was a pro-life Catholic in the governor's office, Governor Ritter. But for whatever reason, they didn't do it. And you can argue that they held the bill too long this time. but. The reality is, it got over there in plenty of time. And, really? And, and, and while you're right that every time this fails and is voted down, especially in the fashion that it was last week at the end of the session, when that happens, yes, it does unify 
that liberal base. It does bring more and more support to this issue. And there's some concern from supporters of this bill, people working on it, that a special session depending on the outcome, could jeopardize that. But the bottom line is the public sees through those Republican talking points that they just didn't have enough time. Because at the last day of the session, they had time to debate a lot of bills that actually didn't have time to make it through the process, that hadn't even passed the Senate yet. And they wasted time on those in the House because they were clearly stalling. And everybody well, saw that. And this. so that, that time thing, that was, I mean, that was an argument that no one bought in the first place. But in calling this special session, as everyone's noticed, Hickenlooper says, OK, have some more time, come up with a different reason. Let, let, let me push on it. Were the Republicans dragging their feet? You, you just claim that they had, they had enough time. And I, if they want to put other things on the side, I think they did. They could have done it. But reasonably speaking, did, did they have enough time? Did they, did they filibuster this at the end? Um, I think so. I think Democrats have stumbled onto political gold. It is political <laughs> gold when there's something that your side is uniformly all 100% behind, but you know your opponents are genuinely conflicted on. I remember ten years ago when a lot of states were considering uh, same-sex marriage amendments, Republicans were universally all for them. Democrats were genuinely deeply conflicted, especially uh, among black Democrats, uh, were very conflicted about whether to endorse that or not, or whether to, whether it was a civil rights issue, that kind of thing. So you saw Republicans really enjoy a little bit, I think, seeing that's it's a political game. When you guys are all united and your opponents, it's divide and conquer, and I think it's divide and conquer time now for the Democrats. I don't want to call anyone's personal motives into question. I think there certainly are some true believers that would like to see it done yesterday. Wish it would be done tomorrow, but I think there are some that say this is the, if this if the wind is at our back, and we know our opponents are fighting among themselves. Charge! Let's well, keep not it alive. Charge, as as but can. if the wind is at our back, let's take our own sweet time, particularly in this mm -hmm. important election year. Colorado being one of, if not the swing state for President Obama, this is a winner for uh, for the left, and they've they've been able to work it beautifully. I don't think they're in that big of a rush to actually get it passed. I'm almost surprised that Hickenlooper called the special session for, for this week. If I were he and I was playing purely partisan politics, I might have pushed it maybe to August. Let it, well, we all need our summer break to cool down and then bring, it, bring the fight even closer to, to election time and remind voters just, just how racist and bigoted and homophobic those, those darn Republicans are. Yeah, there's some political imperatives to this, and it certainly benefits the Democrats, benefits them right now. It would benefit them closer to the election as well because people have short memories and remains to be seen what the outcome of this is. I think for Governor Hickenlooper, you know, he's a governor who, at least at the legislature, he's great at recruiting companies and these press conferences and being a salesman for Colorado. At the legislature, this session, he seemed to sort of struggle to really find his footing, to have a real impact on some legislation, to really stand for something. You hear whispers from even Democrats saying, you know, we wish the guy would stick his neck out more. We wish he'd fight for things harder. And this was something that he's, he talked about at the outset of the session in his State of the State speech. This was something that was important to him. He believes in it personally. He has a lot of cabinet members uh, who are gay, who, I mean, he just, he's had restaurant employees, he was telling folks, who didn't have the same rights as everybody else. He feels strongly about this. And this was kind of a layup for him, given the meltdown that happened at the end of the session to come in and say, uh, try again, and for once to look, I think, to, at least to his base, like a strong leader on this, but, but regardless of how it You were plays telling out. me that some Democrats didn't want this special session. There Why? are people working on this bill, whether they're lobbyists or people, Tim Gill's folks, whoever they are, who didn't want this because they won such a clear political victory when that bill died last Tuesday night. They didn't want to mess with that. That wind at their back is so strong right now, and, and it sort of does speak to what you're talking about, that... They, they, they believe in this strongly, they want it, they're fighting for it, they're putting tons of money into it. But if it takes a little while, especially takes through the end of a big election year, that might be okay. All right, let's do a little prediction time. As I said, we've taped this before the special session started. It started on Monday. As you're watching this, what do you think happened? I think Republicans dig in. I think you don't have another option. You have to dig in, make a principled stand, and hope to sell it. Go back to folks and say either A, this is why we need more than a one-seat majority. We are the bolt. We are the uh, you know the the line in the sand here, stopping this from happening. And open just as Democrats are going to open the floodgates of money from folks that are, want to fund uh, gay rights initiatives. Open the floodgates, hopefully for for social conservatives and, and folks that you know oppose the. Idea. So you you think this thing fails? I I think it may fail. I don't I don't see even if Republicans pass it. I don't think they can move on. I think it's still all the credit will go to Governor Hickenlooper 
and they'll still look like the losers, even if they pass it. I don't see a We're Republicans. We always look like the losers. <laughs> it's what we do so very well. How would it be different? I mean, the way it worked this time, it made it through the judiciary. It made it through appropriations. This would have to really fall on Frank McNulty, the speaker, if it were to fail, he'd have to switch up the, either the committee assignments or send it to a different committee. He would. He could do the same thing he did last time, but I think probably he would send it to a different committee. They can also gavel and go. They do not have to do what the governor tells them to do. They have to consider what he tells them to consider, but they don't have to pass something because he told them to pass it. They don't have, there's no, say, it has to get out of at least the first committee. It has to come to the floor because the governor told you. They can... Uh, quickly uh, stuff it to their kill committee and then so, be gone. So in other words, they could take it, send it to state affairs, it's dead, it's gone, and life is over. And go home. What do you yeah, think? And I think you make your prediction. Well, I, I think we'll know by the time this airs what happens, but I think that's a fairly realistic scenario just because the speaker knows that if it does get through committees, there are 33 votes on the House floor, an effective majority on the other side that can make sure that bill comes up for a vote. I mean, that's why we had the recess the other night the majority had become the minority and didn't have the votes and they had to shut it all down. And there's no way we're going to see that happen again. And so I think the likeliest scenario is that if they do dig in on this and say, we're killing it again, we've got all this blood on our hands already, you know, we're not going to switch. We're not going to let the governor get all the credit. This is our issue. We're making our stand. They probably switch to the committees or send it to a different committee but is and it, let it get killed there. Is it making their stand? In other words, we, we know how leadership feels about it. I think we know uh, Frank McDulty has been outspokenly against it. Amy Stevens has been outspokenly against it. And she needs to be, given her uh, tight primary that she's going, going to have and, and, and her district. But is that what the rest of the Republicans want? Has there been a poll? And here's, here's my suspicion. Given the 33 uh, votes the Republicans have on the, on the House, if this made it to the floor, being certain that it would pass, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw not just three or four of them switch over. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw 10, 12, maybe even 15, because you know if, if it's going to pass and that's going to be it, we want to be seen as, as, as the guys who were part of it. This was a bipartisan thing. Maybe leadership didn't want it, but you know we voted for it. Possible? Yeah, I think that's I think that's likely, and I think you know you just have to look at this. Um, the Republicans they've already lost the PR battle. Their own press folks. One of their press people was Ken Buck's spokesman in 2010, and he told me a couple times last week, this is way messier than any of the screw-ups Ken Buck ever made. I mean, there's no saving this for, <laughs> that, that's, uh, you know, uh, sorry, Owen, but that's, that's what he said. And, you know, there's just this sense that it's a mess, and I don't know exactly what happens, but it just doesn't really work for the Republican Party going forward. There are Republicans, not just in the House caucus, um, maybe more than we know who might vote for this in the end. But there are so many outside the building. Mario Nicholas, who fought for the GOP on the reapportionment commission at the Capitol at every hearing, telling me the other night that this bill will ultimately pass, but unfortunately, he says, so will the House GOP majority. It's over. And that's his, that's, he just feels that the public is in one place and House leadership is, is just not there. And he thinks that's a negative for Republicans across the state. My prediction is, and, and, and tell me, well, you guys disagree, but I think this thing passes in special session. Again, you'll know, you'll know by the time this airs, more, more than likely. I think that McNulty plays it straight. I think he'll say, well, we send it to the appropriate committees. It was the Democrats that didn't give us enough time, so we're going to send it back to the appropriate committees, depending on what it is, and we're going, we're going to, it's going to get the floor vote at which point it, it passes. I wouldn't be surprised if Sean Mitchell's uh, amendment comes back. And I think this is a very important uh, amendment. What it says was there's a freedom of association issue. And yes, uh, people of the same sex can have a civil union, but it doesn't mean that you can sue the photographer if he refuses to go and he says, no, gay wedding's not what I do, sorry that uh, the homosexual community can't go and say, ah, that's a civil rights violation, we're going to bring you up on equal rights charges and civil rights charges. Sean Mitchell's amendment would say, no, it, it, the, the state recognizes it, but you can't force people to, to be part of it if they don't want to. There's Thought certainly a public accommodations argument there about the you know, discrimination in private groups and, and businesses being able to discriminate. I think you can look to states like New York when they passed gay marriage last year. Um, there was a, an agreement among, from Democrats to accept some language about 
um, you know, exempting religious groups or folks that have uh, religious objections to doing business with uh, gay folks. So I think you may see something. I think Democrats would even be amenable to some limited language. But if it goes too far, as it did, I think they thought it went too far, the proposal, Sean Mitchell's amendment, that they felt like would have engendered maybe more discrimination than exists no, now. No, no, just said you, you, when you have a civil union, it you has to be a Mormon civil union. That, that's all he wanted. Yeah. He's a Mormon. It was a joke. Lighten up. <laughs> All right. You may see some, you may see some language like that. I think I don't know. It depends if everybody wants to get it done or you want to win the political points. It kind of depends. It's hard to say. It's it it's it's going to be a fight. The the amendment, uh, the association. I, I could see maybe a watered down version of that if they thought that would help them win at the end of the day. You know, then maybe it gets on. But again, the point you and and we've been making is that maybe winning for the bill sponsor for Democrats at least isn't winning. And so I don't know how far they go in conceding. Um, especially because they feel like that amendment is discriminatory. So there's a principle there that they may not compromise. And if this fails and implodes again, I think Democrats are fairly confident that the blame will again go to the Republicans in the House who kill it. I think there's also a good possibility they'll send it to the people. This, they can put forward a resolution. They can, they can refer things to, to the public. We do it all the time. And this seems to be the perfect one. Just wash your hands and go, this is a public issue. Let the public decide how they feel. And if, in fact, what you report that 75% of Coloradans are fine with it, they should have no trouble. Well, 46% of Republicans were polled at the state GOP assembly. Those aren't, you know, armchair Republicans. Those yeah. are the ardent conservatives. And that's about half of them saying, you know, this is something that isn't that important. I mean, the, the arguments that conservatives make at these hearings that it's about individual freedom and limited government. You know, there are conservatives out there who really don't care about this and, and some who feel passionately that it, that it should pass. But Referring I do think it? that there, it, it can be dangerous, and this is condescending to say, it can be dangerous to assume the public can understand some nuances. As you know, I think we've been interesting in the last day or so how Republicans have been describing the special session as on gay marriage. The public definitely is not, ha, responds differently when you ask them about civil unions than if you ask them about gay marriage. The North Carolina amendment that just passed banned civil unions as well as gay marriage, but a lot of voters in exit polls didn't know that. Um, so I think that, that there are some Democrats who genuinely do, aren't sure how it would do with the polls, they might think. Well, in 2006, we had two measures on. One, a constitutional ban on gay marriage, using that term. And it took the DOMA law, the Defense of Marriage Act, that was in statute and put it into the Constitution. Now, if we ever want to change it, we can. It just needs a vote of the people. Likewise, there was a citizen's initiative that was a civil unions, not gay marriage. The words were civil unions. That was soundly defeated. So you believe that things have changed so much. I, I think Coloradans understand the difference. And since it's already in the Constitution, if it's a statutory change, they could only use the word civil unions or something to that effect. Would yeah, it's it a lot different when you're trying to talk to, when you're talking about 100 lawmakers versus voters across right. the state who can be swayed and influenced by not just lobbyists, but by, you know, thousands and millions of dollars of, of TV money, perhaps. So, yeah, it's a different ball game. Not clear whether the 72% that support in the poll would come through if there was a measure. I think that's why the Democrats are, you know, fighting this fight at the Capitol. I think there's another element here that makes everything really complicated and interesting, which is we don't have any statewide races this year except for President of the United States and then ballot measures, which currently the only one on is legalizing marijuana. There, are, Nothing happens in a vacuum. Anything that happens in a state, certainly national parties are watching very closely. Everybody says there, there is Colorado a, there is a is CU region seat that will yes, be a there statewide. Is a CU, of course, that's not what that, you call like high profile. Critical. So everything is about. Obama versus Romney. Sure. Who and will that bring out? Who will a civil unions thing bring out? Who would a gay marriage amendment bring out? I mean, but think about it. So we're going to have, if, if it goes to the ballot, we're going to have pot and civil unions on the ballot along with o Obama. It, it, and I it think would we'll be have fun. personhood again. I think and of course, per personhood, because that has to go on every year now. Apparently, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a law. Talk to me a little bit about the state of the Republican Party, because I see it up close. I mean, this, these are my people. And I see such a battle inside. And this has been a constant battle. It's been social conservatives versus the libertarian uh, conservatives. And I put myself in that camp. And we agree on 99% of everything. But on those few things, it turns into warfare. And it splits the party up. And I, I think you're going to see that if this ever makes it to a to a House vote, and you, you, you tell me, you were, you were doing some work trying to find out how our delegation's going to vote 
in the presidential election. It, the, not our delegation, but how are the people that we're sending to Tampa right. to choose uh, the, the Republican presidential right. nominee. They can only vote for someone that's on the ballot. They're, most of our delegates are free agents, kind of. We're, we have a weird state in that they're not, way. They're not, they're not committed. They're not, not committed. They, they committed. They can kind of choose whoever they want legally. Uh, Santorum won our, our presidential preference caucuses here in February. He probably will not be on ballots in Tampa, which means they will be free to choose. And, and then wooable, I guess, for any candidate. Well, every time I go talk to Republicans, I always want to ask this question. Romney did so well here in 2008. Won here, next day dropped out. It was a McCain state. A lot of folks say that the reason that Colorado this did wasn't not a stay in the R. You know, this was an Obama state, you meant. Yes, but yeah, I'm saying right. it, it was. And then, I mean, the, when they chose their presidential choice, and a lot of Republicans will, will frankly say that they feel like McCain did not do the work he needed to do here um, to get Romney supporters on his side. So the question now is, will Romney now, who is the guy, do the work required to get conservatives in Colorado on his side or, you know, active and engaged as they need to be. I don't think know. Think about this tough position that Romney's in then. He's got to win Colorado. So he's got to come in and he's got to woo the Santorum vote because yeah. the, you need you need uh, that base because he is d distant from that base. The base doesn't trust him. The social conservative mm -hmm. base uh, doesn't trust him. Those of us who are economic conservatives look at health care in Massachusetts and we have issues. But then at the same time, he has to reach particularly unaffiliated women voters and those are you can't imagine how different it's going to be yeah I think you know in Colorado at least I think the president has the advantage when it comes to those swing voters those women living in the suburbs I think he just has a working advantage there I think every time there's a story about gay marriage or a social issue it helps him there you know Romney wants to talk about the economy eventually as this thing gets closer to November we're going to see an incredibly negative race. And um, I think that enthusiasm or whatever, it, you know, excitement, interest, passions will rise as we get closer to the fall. But it's not going to be like 2008 on either side. It's not going to be like how voters felt about Obama on either side. This is kind of a lesser of two evils election. Obama's not the president the Democrats thought. Romney's certainly not the candidate a lot of Republicans wanted. And here you have this choice. And I think it's going to be very negative, and it's about who turns out, especially in those suburbs. And I think because those swing voters tend to be more female, um, I think the president has a working advantage there. Romney definitely has his work cut out for him in the, Colorado. The difference being that, like an inkblot test, in 08, Obama was whoever you wanted him to yeah. be. He was for hope and change and unicorns and rainbows, <laughs> and you could see whatever you wanted to see in that man. Four years later, gas prices have risen higher than any presidential term, even under Jimmy Carter. Uh, unemployment is still still dogging us. And while we're seeing some economic growth, it's certainly not on fire. We, we now get a better idea who we put into office. He's not going to have the same pixie dust that he did did, did last time. Certainly not, but I think uh, surprisingly, it would, even though all indications would indicate otherwise, I think it's going to be pretty, a pretty pro-incumbent year. Maybe because things are so bad, people just kind of throw up their hands and they're not engaged in the process. They don't, you know, whatever schlub comes after, he's not going <laughs> to fix it either. There was a Tea Party. <laughs> there was a Tea Party wave in 2010, not didn't, not as effective here as in other states. It's like, well, they didn't change, they didn't fix it. Anyway, so either, uh, you know, I think you're going to see very depressed turnout compared to 2008, maybe not compared to a typical midterm. It's interesting about, so in other words, that people are so discouraged, they're going to go, I don't yeah. care. Well, I think, too, both you know, homes. Obama, we know that he's not, he's not the magic man that we thought he was. We know that as president, he struggled. He was a great campaigner. He struggled as president. He's not necessarily, you know, it took him a long time to find his footing. Um, Romney may be a great president in that he's managed people his entire life. That may be true, but he's got to make that case. And now we're in campaign season again. And when you watch these two campaign, Obama is an incredibly gifted campaigner. Compare the two stops that we've seen recently. Obama in Boulder getting all this attention by just dropping into the sink bar, taking pictures with a couple of co-eds. And that's all anybody talks about is the sort of impromptu um, masterstroke moments. Romney last week is out on the plains in Fort Lupton. He has this beautiful event with the mountains. But what people are talking about, and maybe it's just poor luck and poor timing on his part, but it's the day the president announces his position in favor of gay marriage. And Romney doesn't get any attention about being there and supporting the oil and gas industry. What he gets are questions about gay marriage. Maybe it's luck. Maybe it's timing. That stuff kind of evens out over a campaign. But I think Obama's skills on the campaign trail are, um, you know, pretty unique. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, we're going to have to watch going forward. What about the flip-flop on 
on gay marriage. You, you know, this, this guy was very clear. I don't support gay marriage, and uh, he's been on record as not supporting gay marriage, and now the president supports gay marriage. Is it, is it so popular that that's just a given? I don't know that they're, they're definitely going to make the argument that he changed his positions. The question is, will voters make a distinction? Because a lot of people personally are changing their opinions about um, gay rights and, and same-sex couples. The distinction between that and what the, the charge against Mr. Kerry on national defense, maybe they're not as willing to say you could change your mind or you know your opinions change day by day. But whereas something that's in your family or a personal issue, they give you more pass on changing your mind on that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there, there's almost something familiar about him flip-flopping because so many Americans have flip-flopped on this, and more and more. You know, six years ago, this thing failed. Uh, very strongly in Colorado. I just don't know if Mitt Romney wants to start talking about foot flops. I think that right. plays in the Democrats' hands. I don't think he wants to start talking about gay rights. That plays in the Democrats' hands. He wants to talk about the economy. These social things are very squishy, especially gay marriage and civil unions for a Republican like Mitt Romney. And so at this point, it's all about the economy. They're going to give Obama a pass, I think, on this gay marriage flip flop, which it is. He changed positions, but it's not where they want to take this campaign. I think any time the administration can point to f social issues, as they did with the contraceptive issue, another brilliant move, mm -hmm. it, it, it alienates that audience we like. All right, 30 seconds left. So, civil unions don't pass in Colorado? I say they dig it. They, they pass eventually. I don't know if they pass next week. They don't pass, they don't pass yeah, in I'm, a special session? I'm with her. I don't think so. I'm going to take the opposite one. Beers. You owe me the beer afterwards. Next time. Eli, thank you. Kristen, Thanks. thank you, and thank you. Learn more about the Independence Institute. Go to independenceinstitute.org. Join me on Sunday afternoons on KHOW. It starts at 5 o'clock. Tell a friend about Devil's Advocate. We'll see you next week.